Hi everyone. So this time, how about I take you on a journey to a new Earth, an Earth 2.0. Having worked on NASA's Kepler mission and being passionate about long duration human space flight, I thought I will merge these two topics together and take you on an out of this world exciting journey. Are we alone? This has been an eternal question that mankind has had. Since the ancient times, humanity has been curious about the stars and if there is life elsewhere. Our search for signs of extraterrestrial life continues. When we search for such alien life, we focus on what, where, how, when. Let's start with the what. What do we look for? The first question that comes to mind is, is it possible for life like that here on Earth even to exist anywhere else in the universe? Would it be carbon based like here on Earth? What do we look for exactly? Today, even the existence of microbial life form anywhere in our solar system is going to be the most exciting discovery mankind has ever made, right? That is how, despite knowing Mars is a very extreme environment, hostile environment, we have landed five rovers on the surface of Mars to look for signs of microbial life even if it's in fossilized form. We do this because we have seen evidence of that here on Earth. We have found extremophiles in extreme environments on Earth, deep down in caves where there is not a trace of sunlight, around hydrothermal vents at the bottoms of oceans, in toxic waters in the vicinity of volcanoes, and most recently even 3,000 feet below the ice shelf in Antarctica where life was thought to be impossible. Tardigrades are a good example. They have been found everywhere on our planet and even have survived in space. They survive extreme environments where all other life will perish. So if such extremophiles can survive anywhere on Earth, it gives us hope that life can exist anywhere in the universe. And remember, we are still talking about Loki or life as we know it, that is carbon-based life. So we are limited by what we know about life in our search for life. Imagine the possibilities of non-carbon based life. How about silicon based life or methane based life? We can think of all the possibilities, but we are limited in our search based on the knowledge of life as we know it. One thing is clear though, the existence of simple microbial life is more probable than the existence of complex intelligent life forms. That is because the evolution of simple microbial life takes a very shorter amount of time as compared to the evolution of complex intelligent life form. Look at our planet for example. Here it took more than a billion years after the birth of our planet for single celled organisms to form. Multicellular life is just recent, just 900 million years old and modern humans that is us, we have evolved from ancestral humans just a few hundred thousand years ago just recently on the universal time scale. So complex intelligent life has evolved just recently on our 4.5 billion year old planet. There are several factors that affect the evolution of complex and intelligent life forms like us. It begins with the star and its life. Our sun is a G dwarf type star. Its age is 4.6 billion years. There are stars that are bigger and hotter than our sun, but their lifespan is shorter. It's just one to five billion years. That is not enough for life to evolve on any planets that might be around those stars. Look at our Earth and Sun, for example. The amount of time it took for life to evolve here is the lifespan of these giant stars. So planets around these stars will not get the right amount of time for life to evolve on them, even if the conditions were right. So then where do we look? Let us talk about the Francis Drake's equation. No matter how controversial it is, I believe it gives us the direction, a pathway to guesstimate the number of extraterrestrial intelligent civilizations out there in our galaxy. I like how it ties up together important factors to consider when we look for alien life. It begins with star formation, fraction of those stars that can have planets, number of planets around those stars that can support life, 
the fraction of those planets that actually go on to develop intelligent life that is civilizations fraction of those civilizations that develop technology to send out detectable signals of their existence into space and then the length of time they send those signals into space out for so coming back to my question of where to look drake's equation focuses on planets that can support life one such planet is the one we live on our earth is the best benchmark we have when we look for planets that might harbor life in this universe our earth our sun earth system is the model we know that has life even intelligent life on it so this is the best model to compare with when we are looking for a planet and star system that might harbor li life right with just with this intention nasa launched the kepler telescope in 2009 to look for earth like planets around sun like stars in their habitable zones in our galaxy all the kepler has been looking at just one section of the sky in the cygnus and lyra constellation this was the first time we used a spectrometer and the transit method to look for planets around stars in our galaxy kepler provided us with amazing findings it found several multiplanetary star systems like our solar system for star wars fans it found a real life version of the tatooine a real life binary star system with a planet orbiting it it found hundreds of giant jupiters and neptunes it found water worlds and eventually it found hundreds of earth sized planets orbiting m dwarf stars in our galaxy we have more m dwarf stars than any other star type and we have found many earth like planets around just these types of stars now our earth is in the habitable zone of our star so what makes a planet habitable first criteria for a habitable planet is it has to be a rocky planet you cannot have life on gas giants right next it has to have water in liquid form so it has to be at the right distance from the star so that the water doesn't evaporate or freeze but it stays in liquid form and that distance where just enough heat from the star reaches the planet to keep the water in liquid form is called the habitable zone let's talk about the m dwarfs for a moment because we said that the m dwarfs has a better probability of having earth like planets around them compared to the super giant stars right so let's look at the m dwarfs they are smaller cooler dimmer than our sun so what is going to happen is their habitable zone it is going to move in towards them compared to that of our sun because the heat from the m dwarfs doesn't reach out as far as the heat from our sun does this results in its habitable zone planets being closer to the star when the planets get that close to the star they might get tidally locked to the star which means they cannot rotate around themselves because of the star's gravitational pull just like our moon is tidally locked to our earth and it cannot rotate around itself so we see the same face of the moon always right so if these planets cannot rotate that means they are not going to have a day night cycle like we have here on earth one side of them will be facing their star always and the other side will always be freezing cold because it's away from the um a hot side of the star right so one side will be warm the other will always be cold so these are definitely not earth like planets even if the planet is not close enough to be tidally locked to its m dwarf star the way an m dwarf star interacts with its planet is different from the way our sun interacts with our earth because they are smaller cooler and dimmer the amount of radiation they send out to their planets and the amount of gravitational interaction that's quite different between that star and its planet compared to our earth sun system and this results in the vegetation the atmosphere and the type of life that can evolve on these kind of planets if at all it could evolve in the star's lifetime be very different from what we have here on earth basically kepler has found several earth cousins we call them earth cousins and not twins because their star and planet system is different than our sun and earth when we find some planet like the earth around a sun like star then we will call it an earth twin so we found these earth cousins but they are 
several hundreds of light years away from us. So we cannot even reach them. So the search is still ongoing. After Kepler retired, NASA launched the TESS telescope, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It works just like Kepler does, but where Kepler was focusing in only one section of the sky, TESS is looking at all the sections of sky 360 degree around us. Plus, it's looking at planets that are comparatively closer to us. Um, the closest star system is the Alpha Centauri. So it's looking at planets around stars that are that close to us. So we hope to find Earth 2.0 using TESS. Now the James Webb Space Telescope, the largest telescope yet, it will take us a step further in our search for life. It will examine the atmospheres of the habitable zone planets and it will look for traces of gases that indicate the presence of life such as water vapor, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide and methane. This will help us confirm that there is some form of life on those habitable worlds and it could very well possibly be the next Earth we are looking for. So now we've discussed what to look for and where to look. Next is the question of how do we look for life? Let's think of the methods we've adopted so far to look for signs of intelligent life. We've been sending radio signals aimed at star systems for several years now. The WOW signal, it's the only strong narrowband radio signal that we've received here on Earth till date. Although it remains a mystery and scientists and astronomers haven't confirmed it yet, I believe it is the only and best candidate um, that is a signal received here on Earth that might be an indication or evidence of an alien civilization that sent it our way. We have sent radio signals in the direction of the Sagittarius constellation that is believed to be the source of the WAV signal, but we haven't received anything back. Think about this though, even if we send signals from the Earth, the question is, are there technological societies like ours that will be able to receive and recognize those signals? Civilizations need to be technologically advanced enough to be able to communicate with us, to be able to recognize and interpret the signals that we send them. So if we haven't received any signals yet, that either means that civilizations exist that are not as technologically advanced as us, or it could mean there are civilizations that are way more advanced than us and are trying to communicate with us with a technology that we are not aware of yet, we are not familiar with yet. Um, just like if we would try to communicate with cavemen using our cell phones through chat messages. Or those civilizations choose not to communicate with us because we are too primitive for them or um, they do not find it worth their time to communicate with a sub-intelligent species like us. Then also think of how vast the universe is, how spread out the stars in our galaxy itself are. The closest stars to us are in the Alpha Centauri system that is about four light years away from us. If a civilization does send out a signal to us, will it reach us in time for us to detect it even? Existing radio telescopes on Earth, they can detect radio signals from Earth only from a light year away roughly. The vast distances and our technological limitations, they might be making it impossible for us to detect signals from other civilizations or transmit signals to them over such large distances. Imagine traveling such vast distances with the current propulsion technology. It's impossible to get there in our lifetimes because it will take thousands of years for us to get there even if we travel as fast as the fastest spacecrafts we have deployed. The New Horizons spacecraft that flew by Pluto and the Voyager spacecraft that have left the solar system and have entered the interstellar space. They have been traveling at a speed of roughly 10 miles per second. At their speeds, it will take the Voyagers about 40,000 years to reach the Alpha Centauri system, which is the closest to us. So traveling in our lifetimes with this propulsion technology is out of question. We definitely need technology that will help us travel faster so that we can visit the new Earths that we will discover someday. That brings me to the final question on my list. When are we ready to travel to newer exoplanets today? New Earths if we find them? It has been 52 years since we landed on the moon. We are yet to land the first humans on Mars. 
which is just our neighboring planet. It is just recently that we have started focusing on going back to the moon as a part of the Artemis missions. When we go back to the moon in the next few years and when humans arrive on Mars one day, we plan on setting up sustainable bases on both as the first step for humans to be able to live in other places than the Earth. When humans go to live and work on the moon and Mars, they will go there for longer durations, months and years eventually. Some of the major challenges of long duration human spaceflight today are the physiological and the psychological challenges that the humans will face while working and living in long duration in the extreme environment of space. We need permanent long-term solutions to these challenges before we can start traveling to other planets. At NASA, we understand the importance of all of these factors and the safety and well-being of our crew is our topmost priority. That is why there is a lot of research going on in all these areas at NASA currently um, so that we can understand the problems better and come up with effective long-term solutions. So you see, we are still in the nascent stages of preparing for long duration deep space human space flight. We're going back to the moon now as a part of the Artemis missions to use the moon as the test bed for all our technologies that humans will need to live and survive on the moon and Mars and beyond. We are laying the foundation, the groundwork for our future generations to build upon and to make travel to distant worlds possible one day. In the past 52 years, we've made great technological advances in the space industry and we continue to get better. With privatization of the space industry, we now have more players with newer ideas and methods of improving space travel. This gives further hope to the future of space travel and to reaching new world. So if we as humanity put aside our differences and come together for this one goal of exploring new worlds, if we dedicate our resources and our focus to this goal, we will become a spacefaring species sooner than we can imagine. If we continue to keep the pace of the past 50 years, I'm positive in the next 100 years, we will have developed the technology, the capability to help us travel faster to the closest habitable zone planets near our solar system. We will be able to travel to that new Earth, to Earth 2.0, to the new Terra. So let's keep continuing this pace. Let's keep working towards this goal and let's keep aiming upwards and onwards. Thank you.